The Word of God, the Holy Bible, is a treasure and a gift beyond compare. Every passage of it points to a marvelous truth that God's love for man impelled him to step out of eternity and unite with his creation in order to redeem him from sin. Jesus Christ is both the author and subject of this precious word. Join us at the Superior Word each week as we search out this wonderful gift in search of Christ Jesus. So what we're going to do now is we're going to read Psalm number 43. I tell people, I had I told somebody this week, he called me who is in distress, and we talked for a while, and my heart goes out to the people that call and they need to talk, because uh, most people know I hate the telephone. I literally hate the telephone, but if somebody calls and I know that they need to talk, I will pick up if I am in, okay? But I uh, will say this, is that I said the same thing to him that I say to almost everybody that is in distress. Go read Psalm 42 and 43. We read 42 earlier, and we're just doing this in normal order, but this is the two Psalms that I find so uplifting personally. And if you don't have enough, then keep reading the Psalms. But you're going to get to some that are Psalms of imprecation. Break their teeth in their mouths, oh God, and, you know, destroy the wicked. And that, that's not really uplifting, okay? Oh, I understand yeah, I mean. that. It can be. It can be, depending on what you're praying for. As a matter of fact, one of my friends, a couple weeks ago, we were out to lunch after missions. I won't give his name, but you might know who it is. He said, I always pray for somebody in high places. I won't say his name, Okay. And uh, he said, it's the right thing to do. And I thought if I did that, I would pray a psalm of imprecation over that person. Okay. Listen, if David did it, it's good enough for me. Okay. That doesn't mean I won't pray for that person to be saved. I will do that. But as long as he is in his unsaved condition, I have no tolerance for what they're doing. Zero. Okay. Here we go. We're in Psalm 43. Vindicate me, O God. And plead my cause against an ungodly nation. O oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for you are the God of my strength. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Then... I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you, O God, my God. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. We are in Joshua 11, it's verses 1 through 15. This is entitled, The Waters of Merom. And it came to pass when Javin, king of Hatzor, heard these things that he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, to the king of Shimron, to the king of Achshaf, and to the kings who were from the north, in the mountains, in the plain south of Kinneret, in the lowland and in the heights of Dor, on the west, to the Canaanite in the east and in the west, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite in the mountains, and the Hivite below Hermon in the land of Mizpah. So they went out, they and all their armies with them, as many people as the sand that is on the seashore in multitude, with very many horses and chariots. And when all these kings had met together, they came and camped together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. But the Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid because of them, for tomorrow... About this time, I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. You shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. So Joshua and all the people of war with him came against them suddenly by the waters of Merom, and they attacked them. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who defeated them and chased them to greater Sidon, to the brook Mizraphot, and to the valley of Mizpah eastward, they attacked them until they left none of them remaining. So Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. Joshua turned back at that time and took Hatzor and struck its king with the sword, for Hatzor was formerly the head of all those kingdoms. And they struck all the people who were in it with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. There was none left breathing. Then he burned Hatzor with fire. 
So all the cities of those kings and all their kings Joshua took and struck with the edge of the sword. He utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. But as for the cities that stood on their mounds, Israel burned none of them except Hatzor only, which Joshua burned. And all the spoil of these cities and the livestock, the children of Israel took as booty for themselves, but they struck every man with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, and they left none breathing. As the Lord had commanded Moses his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. The passage today continues the same pattern that has been presented in Joshua. One step logically follows after another as each story about the life of Joshua and Israel unfolds in typology, pointing to the person and work of Christ and the lives of his people in him. Now, just this week, somebody emailed me a passage from 1 Corinthians, I believe it was, and he said, we have this typology in the Old Testament, but isn't there anything else that we can derive from a passage? And I said, there's usually four things that you can derive from a passage. You can see typology, you can see prophecy, you can see morality, a moral issue, and then you can also see a literal historical value in it. So there's those four things known as the quadriga. Today you're going to see three of them. We're going to go through the literal historical thing. We're going to see the typology, and we'll also see um, the not so much prophetic, but probably the moral aspect of this. And if you think of it as we're going through these type of sermons, think of those four things and you'll see how they point to all of redemptive history, just so you know this. There is a battle to be waged in our verses here today. It anticipates a battle that we face today. The victory is already found in Christ, but we still have to live out our lives in Christ, and we constantly face enemies that come against us. Paul speaks of this in Ephesians 6. He writes of spiritual warfare as an unseen enemy. The fact is, the unseen enemy is working out his devices in real people and real teachings in the world. That is perfectly evident from Paul's words when they are rightly considered. He spells out his thoughts on this spiritual warfare beginning in Ephesians 6 verse 10, which is today's text verse. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. The words here seem more spiritual and less tangible as if there is this unseen battle that we somehow have to guard against. But his continued thoughts show us that the spiritual side only points to realities that we must face in our Christian lives. There is the gospel of peace. It is a spiritual thing, but it is realized in real people. There are fiery darts of the wicked one. That isn't the devil just shooting unseen arrows at you. It includes false teachers and preachers who are pointing their heresies at you, trying to destroy your faith, and so on. The spiritual things Paul speaks of are realities we face. If people would understand this, there would be less hype and sensation about Ephesians chapter 6, and there would be a lot more proper doctrine and getting the truth about Jesus out to those who need to hear it. These things are typologically anticipated in today's passage. Such great things as this are to be found in his superior word. And so, let us turn to that precious word once again, and may God speak to us through his word today, and may his glorious name ever be praised. I've got three thoughts for you today. The first is, so they went out, verses 1 through 5. Verse 1, and it came to pass when Javin, king of Hatsor, heard these things. The words are based upon what was recorded in chapter 10, where the Gibeonites called Joshua to rescue them when attacked by the five kings. From there, Joshua defeated the five kings and went on to subdue the area of the Southland. With that coming to the ears of Jabin, the account now begins. The name Jabin, or Yavin, has to do with discernment, coming from the word bin, meaning to discern. The name means he perceives, he discerns, he understands, the wise, the intelligent. 
This name may be a hereditary title of the ruler of Hatzor because it is the same name used at a much later date as found in Judges chapter 4. The name Hatzor or Hatzor actually has various meanings based on its root, which signifies to begin, to cluster, or gather. It may mean, and you wonder how all these are connected, just think of clustering, village, trumpet, leak, enclosure, and so on. The city will eventually fall within the borders of Naphtali, as recorded in Joshua 19. Verse 1 continues, that he sent to Jovav, king of Madon, to the king of Shimron, to the king of Achshaf. Jabin is the primary subject, but he needs an alliance in order to deal with the pressing issue. The Israelites flooding over the land and destroying city after city. Hence, he calls out to other kings in order to form such an alliance. The name Jobab or Yovav comes from Yavav, meaning to cry in a shrill voice. As such, his name means to cry shrilly, crying out, or to lament. His city is Madon, coming from Din, meaning to judge. Thus, it probably means contention or strife. Shimron comes from Shamar, to watch or guard. Hence, it is watching or vigilant guardian. Strong's defines it as guardianship. Shimron will eventually be located within the borders of Zebulun. Ahshaf is probably from Hashaf, meaning to practice sorcery. Hence, it signifies fascination or bewitched. The city will eventually be located within the borders of Asher. Along with the call out to these kings, the petition next reaches much further. Verse 2, and to the kings who are from the north in the mountains. The word mountain here is singular. Ve'el hamlachim asher mitzvon behar. And to the kings who from north in the mountain. This probably then refers to the hill country as a single mountain. And so it may refer to the mountainous area of Naphtali noted in Joshua 20 verse 7. Verse 2 continues. In the plain south of Kinnerot. Uba arava negev Kinnerot. And in the arava south Kinnerot. The meaning is the plain that extends south from the Lake of Galilee to the Dead Sea, as noted in Deuteronomy 1. It says there, these are the words Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan in the wilderness in the Arava, opposite Suf, between Paran and Tophel, Lavan, Hatzorot, and Di Zahav. That's Deuteronomy 1.1. As a reminder, the word comes from Arav, to grow dark. That is identical to Arav, to grow take or to give in pledge. Kinnerot comes from kinor, meaning a harp. That comes from a root meaning to twang. Verse 2 continues, in the lowland and in the heights of Dor on the west. Uba shefla, uba nafot, Dor miyam. And in the lowland and in heights Dor from west. The shefla is the lowland noted in Joshua 9 verse 1. It is a broad, flat plain extending south from Mount Carmel. The heights of Dor is literally the sieves of Dor. The meaning is that as a sieve is raised, it pours out. Hence, it can signify heights or borders of an area. Dor means to dwell, but it is identical to the word translated as generation, as in the time period of one's dwelling. Next, verse 3, to the Canaanites in the east and in the west, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, the Jebusite in the mountains, and the Hivite below Hermon in the land of Mizpah. More correctly, the words read, the Canaanite from east and from west, and the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Jebusite in the mountain, meaning the hill country, and the Hivite under Hermon in land the Mizpah. The list is similar to that that was noted in Joshua 9.1. The meaning of the names are Canaanite, humiliated, humbled, or even subdued. Amorite means talkers in the active sense or renown in the passive sense. Hittite means terrible, terror, fearsome, and parasite, a breach or eruption. Jebusite, treading down in the active or trodden underfoot in the passive. Hivite means villagers or more specifically tent villagers. Hermon means sacred. And finally, Hamitzpah or the Mizpah means the watchtower. This great alliance has been called together to come against Israel in battle, hoping to destroy them in one fell swoop. Verse 4, so they went out, they and all their armies with them. Vayetsu hem vekal machanehem imam. 
And they went out, they and all their camps with them. There's an obvious excitement in the words as it refers to the kings, and then adding in the vast array of camps that accompanied them. A great and epic battle lay ahead that was comprised of, verse 4 continues, as many people as the sand that is on the seashore in multitude. Amrav kahol ashur al sefat hayam la rov. People many, according to the sand upon lip, the sea, to the multitude. The thought is expressed in the superlative, comparable to the stars in the heavens. Just as they could not be counted, so it seemed that the multitudes in this battle could not be counted either. Also, verse 4 continues, with very many horses and chariots. Again, it is stated in the superlative, Vesuf varachev rav me'od, and horse and chariot many very. Noting the horses and chariots is intended to show the vast advantage held by this army. Israel had neither. If these were equipped with iron hooks or size, as would be expected, they would cut through the infantry with ease, mutilating any who were caught in their path. Verse 5, And when all these kings had met together, and made an appointment, all the kings, the these. The idea is that of agreeing to meet at a set place and time in order to join forces. As such, verse 5 continues, they came and camped together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. The words are close enough to get the meaning. The kings, along with their armies, have come to the appointed place, and they have camped together towards the waters of Merom. The name Merom is found only here, and in verse 7, it is formed similarly to the word Marom, or height. As such, it is the highest, or upper waters, of the three lakes in the Jordan Valley, now known as the Hula Valley. Of this area, Albert Barnes notes, this lake occupies the southern half of the Ard el Hule, a depressed basin some 15 miles long and three or four miles wide, lying between the hills of Galilee on the west and the lower spurs of Hermon on the east. The size of the lake varies with the season, and the northern side of it ends in a large swamp. The shape of the lake is triangular, the point being at the south where the Jordan, which enters it on the north, again quits it. There's a considerable space of tableland along the southwestern shore, and here probably the troops of Jabin and his confederates were encamped, preparing to move forward when Joshua and his army fell suddenly upon them. The location was highlighted in a video on YouTube by an adventuresome couple known as Sergio and Rhoda in Israel entitled 500 Million Birds in Hula Valley. Unbelievable! As for this large and impressive army, they will next be described. A battle is set and the foes are gathered together. They want to destroy Israel from the face of the earth. They will come and attack in whatever weather, and if they gain the victory, they will dance with mirth. But we have the Lord on our side, and we have our exalted leader in the battle. There is no way the enemy can abide when we engage the fight and the swords start to rattle. The victory is assured when the Lord is our head. We shall prevail. The Lord is with us. Yes, the enemy will all be found dead when we follow our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Our second thought today, and they attack them. It's verses 6 through 15. Verse 6, but the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid because of them. Vayomer Yehovah el Yehoshua al mipenehem. And said Yehovah unto Joshua, No do fear, singular, he's speaking to Joshua, from their faces. It is the often repeated phrase that the Lord has everything set. Joshua has no need to fret over the enormity of those arrayed against him. Verse 6 continues, For tomorrow, about this time, I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. Rather than about, the wording is exacting. Ki machar ka et hazot anochi noten et kulam halalim lifne Yisrael. For tomorrow, according to the time, thee this, I give all them pierced before Israel. By the time that the hour they are speaking of comes, every soldier of the army will be pierced through. The idea being conveyed here is that Israel has already gone up to meet the enemy, and either a scout has reported the location of their encampment, or Israel is close enough to see them. The distance to where Israel currently is located is too far from Gilgal to have marched in a single day. Regardless of their current location, they will attack 
and they will prevail. Verse 6 continues, you shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. The words are to Joshua in the singular. Susehem takur ve'et marchvotehem tisrof ba'esh. Their horses hamstring, singular, and their chariots burn, singular, in the fire. It's all to Joshua. You are to do this. The words carry several thoughts. The first is that of contempt. The horses and chariots would be dedicated to whatever god the people worshipped. This is seen, for example, in 2 Kings 23. It says there, Then he removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance to the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melech, the officer who was in the court, and he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. Even if not so dedicated, the horse and chariot would be a source of pride and confidence. To destroy them would be as if Israel had destroyed even that which the enemy trusted in. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God, says Psalm 20. This sentiment is found numerous times in the Old Testament, where the horse is an implied source of trust and of victory in battle. Along with this, destroying the horses and the chariots was to teach Israel a future lesson as well. Not only had they prevailed over such a foe, but they were to continue to trust in the Lord and not in their own armaments and abilities. This is seen explicitly in the law when referring to the multiplication of horses, not only for the king of Israel, but for the people as well, from Deuteronomy 17. But he, speaking of the king, shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses, for the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that way again. Verse 7, so Joshua and all the people of war with him came against them. Vayavo Yehoshua vekau am ha milchama imo alehem. And came Joshua and all people the war with him upon them. They are the ones to initiate the events in an offensive battle. This would leave the enemy completely surprised and unable to properly align themselves. This is because Israel came upon them, verse 7 continues, suddenly by the waters of Merom, and they attacked them. Alme Merom pitom va yipelu bahem, upon waters Merom suddenly and fell in them. The obvious strategy was to meet in this area, prepare the army for battle, and then take the battle to Joshua. However, instead of that, Joshua caught them before they were set in any type of battle array. They were given no time to muster the army when they were attacked, and Israel simply fell upon them in a manner that was entirely indefensible. Thus, verse 8, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel. Vayitnem Yehovah beyad Yisrael, and gave them Yehovah in hand Israel. The Lord is the subject and the giver of the enemy. Israel is the recipient. From there, it changes to the plural for the next verbs. Verse 8 continues, who defeated them and chased them to greater Sidon. Vayakum vayirfun ad Sidon rava. And struck, plural, means all the people, them, and chased, all of Israel, all the people, them, to Sidon greater. Sidon comes from Tzud, to hunt. Thus it is hunting place. As it is on the coast, it means to hunt fish, and thus fishery. Combined with the word Rabbah, it would mean great hunting place, or great fishery. Verse 8 continues, to the brook Misrafot, and to the valley of Mizpah eastward. Ve'ad misrafot mayim, ve'ad bikat mitzveh mizraha, and to burning of water, and to valley watchtower eastward. Misrafot comes from saraf, to burn. Combined with mayim, or water, it thus means burning of waters. It is debated what burning of waters means. Some think it is a glass manufacturer. Others think it is hot springs. But the only hot springs in Israel are a bit south and east of the Sea of Galilee. Some think it is smelting pits by water or something else. Regardless, with the flight of the enemy noted, the verse ends with, verse 8 continues, they attacked them until they left none of them remaining. The translation is wrong. The second verb is singular, and so it is speaking of either the Lord or Israel. Israel is the nearest antecedent, and so it is most likely the subject. Israel being the subject. Vayakum ad bilti hishir lahem sarid. And they strike them until none 
he left, singular, to them, survivor. The entire verse thus reads, and he gives them, Jehovah, in hand Israel, and they strike them, and they chase them to great fishery, and to burning of water, and to valley of watchtower eastward, and they strike them until none, he, probably Israel, left to them, survivor. Those who fled from the battle went northwest to Sidon, southwest to Misrafot Maim, and eastward to the valley of Mitzpah. They ran all over. But Israel pursued them and utterly destroyed them. Verse 9, so Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him. The words now are given to confirm the words of verse 6. The word of Jehovah was given and Joshua is shown to have fulfilled it exactingly. Verse 9 continues, he hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots with fire. Exactly as was spoken by the Lord to Joshua, so it is done. Their horses you shall hamstring, and their chariots you shall burn in the fire. And then it says here, their horses he hamstrung, and their chariots he burned in the fire. With that noted, the words continue to refer to Joshua. Verse 10, Joshua turned back at that time and took Hatsor and struck its king with the sword. It appears that with the sudden attack upon the armies and with a sure defeat at hand, the king of Hatsor fled back to his city. As he was the chief and instigator of the planned attack, this is Joshua's first order of business after eliminating all of the other fleeing enemy. As such, he took the city and then struck her king, as the Hebrew says, in the sword. The reason for this is next explicitly stated. Verse 10 continues, for Hatsor was formerly the head of all those kingdoms. Earlier, it was said that the name Hatsor is derived from a root that signifies to begin to cluster or gather. This is almost a typological pun then. Hatsor was the head of this gathering of kingdoms as if it was the trumpet that was blown to gather them together. Because of their position as the head, it was to receive a special mark of punishment that would go beyond what other cities would face. It would be the first and most utterly destroyed. Verse 11, and they struck all the people who were in it with the edge of the sword, utterly destroying them. Vayaku et kao hanafesh asher ba lepi cherev ha cherem. And struck every soul who in her two mouth sword anathematizing. Exactly as was ordered according to the law, so Joshua unfailingly accomplishes. Every soul is devoted to the Lord. This is then further explained. Verse 11 continues, there was none left breathing. Lo notar kal neshema, no remaining every breath. Complete extermination is the command. Nothing is to be left alive, and so in exacting compliance with the law, so it is done. And as a final indignation for initiating the alliance, verse 11 continues, then he burned Hatzor with fire. Ve'et Hatsor saraf ba'esh, and Hatsor he burned in the fire. This was to keep it from being reoccupied. However, in Judges 4 2, it is seen that it was rebuilt despite being within the land grant of Naphtali. At that time, it was ruled by another king, also known as Jabin. For the present time, however, the city would remain unoccupied. Verse 12 So all the cities of those kings and all their kings, Joshua took and struck with the edge of the sword. This is referring to the list of the kings that had joined together in verses 1 and 2. It would be the ideal time to do this because their fighting men had been wiped out. As such, their resistance would be greatly diminished. And fighting men left behind would eventually be worn out. The cities would be quickly overthrown and then destroyed. The words, and all their kings, could mean either that they died in the battle, and they are included in the narrative now, or they could have fled to their cities and were wiped out then. Or new kings were appointed to replace those lost in battle. Once the city was destroyed, the new kings would be executed as well. Verse 12 continues, he utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. The singular, identifying Joshua as the subject, continues here. He anathematized them exactly in accord with the law of Moses. Nothing was left undone that was to be accomplished according to the precepts handed down to him. Think of Jesus. He left nothing undone. Absolutely nothing. Deuteronomy chapter 20. But of the cities of these peoples, 
which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance, you shall let nothing that breathes remain alive, but you shall utterly destroy them, the Hittite and the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite, just as the Lord your God has commanded you, lest they teach you to do according to all their abominations which they have done for their gods, and you sin against the Lord your God. Verse 13, but as for the cities that stood on their mounds, Israel burned none of them. Only all the cities, the standers upon their mound, no burned them Israel. The meaning is that these cities were anathematized, meaning all the life in them, but the structures were not destroyed. They could be inhabited and would be easy to defend. Thus, there was no need to utterly destroy them. The cities were spared. Verse 13 continues, except Hatsor only, which Joshua burned. The exemptions of the previous clause are credited to Israel, while the destruction in this one is credited to Joshua. Zulati et Hatsor lebada saraf Yehoshua. Besides Hatsor, two alone burned Joshua. The leading city of the conflict and the beginning of the gathering was purposefully destroyed as an example, a lesson, and a warning. Verse 14, and all the spoil of these cities and the livestock the children of Israel took as booty for themselves. The law of Cherem, or anathema, is decided by the Lord. If he allows the spoil to be taken by Israel, then they may take it, and in this case, it was granted to them. By the time Israel apportions the land and begins to settle, they would have all they would need to immediately settle down and begin a productive life. For the people in the cities, not so much. Verse 14 continues, but they struck every man with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them and they left none breathing. Rock et kal ha'adam hiku lepi cherev ad hishmidam otam lo hishiru kal neshama. Only every the man struck to mouth sword until they destroyed them, no left any breath. The words the man do not exclude women. Rather, in this case, it speaks of humanity. All humans were slain by the sword until there was no breath left. Verse 15 finishes with, As the Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and so Joshua did. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord had commanded Moses. Every verb in the Hebrew is in the perfect aspect. Thus, it is a mark of total completion of everything conveyed. The sequence of what is said is not to be missed. The Lord commanded Moses, and he completed as commanded. Moses then commanded Joshua, who also completed everything. It is then restated that nothing was left undone. All that the Lord had commanded Moses was completed. The word of God, holy, pure, and perfect too, is given to satisfy man's weary soul. In this life, let us take an eternal view and allow the word to convert us to God's heavenly role. There in the book of life, our names will be because we pursued his word and found Jesus. Innumerable redeemed there by the glassy sea, such a marvelous thing God has done for us. If we will just open the Bible, our own book of life, and accept what it says as holy and true, then between us and God will end the strife. In believing the gospel, life begins anew. Thank you, O oh God, for this marvelous word in accepting its truths. Our place in heaven is forever assured. Our third thought today, pictures of Christ. In the first portion of chapter 10, we had a pretty clear picture of the Judaizers or Hebrew roots movement people coming in and attacking the people of God. What was required was to destroy the five kings once and for all. It was a total ending of the law of Moses, meaning the Torah, the Pentateuch, or the five books of Moses as a means of obtaining God's favor. The second portion of chapter 10 continued to anticipate false teachers and false doctrines such as works-based salvation. Instead, all such avenues are negated by the work of Jesus. This passage continues on with those that come against the completed work of Christ, just as these foes are set to come against and destroy Israel. This is first seen in the leader of the gathering, Jabin, king of Hatzor. Jabin is he understands, or more directly, the wise the intelligent. 
What we see is a picture of those who had come against sound doctrine by the intellectual elite that would stand against the wisdom of God from 1 Corinthians 1. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block, and to the Greeks, foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. As noted, Hatsor has various meanings, but the root word is what is instructing us. It comes from a word signifying to begin to cluster or gather. This is exactly what Paul writes of as expressed to Timothy, from 2 Timothy 4. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Such people are what the epistles focus on. They are the Gnostics with their secret wisdom. They are the intelligentsia who are too smart for the gospel. They are those who want to divide and destroy for their own gain. The only other king mentioned by name is Jobab. That signifies crying out. His city, Madon, signifies contention or strife. He is the type spoken of by Paul in the pastoral epistles. They cry out and lament over the simplicity of the gospel and strive contentiously to destroy it from 2 Timothy 2, but avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And from Titus 3, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Now think of the text verse I gave you earlier, the Ephesians chapter 6 battle that we're in. That's not some spiritual thing that's going on out there. It's something that's happening against you right now. Reject the divisive man after the first and second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. The other two kings were unnamed, but their city's names meant guardianship and fascination, or bewitched. Paul equates the law to a guardianship. That's Galatians 4.2. I would suggest that these are two more types of foes to the gospel, those who still want to cling to the law and those who are sensationalists, focusing on anything but the purity of the gospel. Without going into every name of every location or people group that is then identified, we can assume that they are all allied with those who already are mentioned who come against the gospel. They are the foes of it, and they are aligned against the people of God, ready to destroy them. Together, they meet towards the waters of Merom. The word means height. Its root is used when speaking of the proud from Isaiah 37. Who is it you have mocked and blasphemed? Who have you raised your voice against and lifted your eyes in pride, literally on high, against the Holy One of Israel? This is exactly what those who come against the gospel do. They come against the Holy One of Israel in pride. They say his cross is insufficient or that it is out of reach except for the enlightened or any of 10,000 other permutations of twisting the truth. And yet, despite the innumerable false doctrines and their false teachers, the gospel of Christ remains the only force suitable for salvation. Joshua's battle is promised to be won and that it would be on the following day. As long as Jesus is the leader of our faith, we too shall prevail. With that, in verse 6, the Lord told Joshua, you shall hamstring their horses and burn their chariots with fire. The lesson is that anything that will bring about pride in one's abilities or that will distract us from a total reliance on the Lord must be completely removed. Pride leads to idolatry of self, but salvation is a work of the Lord alone. In verse 7, we saw the attack of Joshua and the people of war upon the waters of Merom. For those who are with Christ Jesus, the attack is against the flowing pride of the false teachers. 
in verse 8. The words went from the singular, the Lord, to the plural, and then back to the singular. The battle is won. I can only speculate what the three places where the enemy fled to and were later destroyed signified. But I would say that the great fishery is the victory of the gospel for those who are fishers of men. The burning of water would be the zeal for the word of those who hold to it as sound instruction, prevailing over the enemy with it. And the valley of the watchtower would be the place where those who carefully watch over the truth of the gospel prevail. I have to admit that's total speculation on my part, but it does fit the typology of waging a war for the purity of the gospel. Verse 9 gave the credit for the actions solely to Joshua. And this is how it should be for any who are in the Lord. He is to receive the credit for destroying the pride of the enemy. Verse 10 then went on to describe Joshua's taking of Hatzor and the killing of the king with his sword. The destruction of the entity that rose up as the head of all of those false doctrines is ultimately accomplished by the Lord. The killing of the king with the sword is a picture of Christ destroying them with the law, remembering from many other sermons that the words sword and horeb, where the law was given, are spelled exactly the same in the Hebrew. He is the embodiment of the law. The gospel is that Christ fulfilled the law, that he died in fulfillment of it, and that he prevailed over it through his resurrection. Our faith in that, as outlined in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4, is what wins the battle and destroys the enemy. With that, verse 11 said that all in the city were anathematized. This is what those who teach false gospels are. They are anathema. As Paul says explicitly in Galatians chapter 1, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. Do you remember I read this a week ago? The Lord keeps repeating these things so that we see that he cares about these things. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Anathema. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. Greek anathema. All false gospels will be utterly destroyed. Only what Christ has done will remain. This is the battle that we are in, and it is just what this passage here today is conveying to us. Verse 12 detailed Joshua's taking all of the other kings and their cities and destroying them with the sword as well. In other words, all who come against the gospel will fail to overcome. God's people will prevail because Jesus has prevailed. Verse 13 curiously mentions the cities of the kings were not destroyed, even though all the inhabitants were. As a note of speculation, and I think it's right, I would say this pictures those teachings that begin on the foundation of Christ, but which divert from the truth. The city, meaning the teaching founded on Christ, will remain, but those who pervert it along with their teachings will be destroyed. Verse 14 said that the children of Israel took the spoil of the cities for themselves. Everything that is good and acceptable is to be saved. Only that which perverts and is wicked will be destroyed. Likewise, there will be rewards and losses for those who belong to Christ, according to the lives they live while in Christ. 1 Corinthians 3, 2 Corinthians 5. Go read it. With that, the verses today end with the words of absolute completion of everything directed by the Lord. The Lord had commanded Moses, the law. Moses commanded Joshua. The law was set forth before Jesus. Joshua followed the instructions completely. Jesus did all the law until it was complete. The text then restated that nothing was left undone. All was finished according to the Lord's commands to Moses. Jesus wholly and entirely fulfilled what he was sent forth to do. The gospel is given based on this and on nothing else. Only Christ accomplished the work. Only Christ's work can bring Israel, meaning God's people, the commonwealth of Israel, to victory. Anything that comes against the gospel is already defeated for all intents and purposes. But it also continues to be defeated in this dispensation of grace. This is the lesson of the passage today. It follows marvelously after the lessons of chapter 10. 
Each step of Joshua is showing us the victory of the Lord in all ways and at all times. He has done it. Now we just need to follow him in the battle and be obedient to what he has set forth. This is the commission that we saw in our text verse today. The overall lesson, once again, is that the Lord is in control. He has a plan, and that plan will come to pass. In the meantime, there are those who come against God's people, be it the Judaizers, those who claim a wisdom that only they can convey, those who hold to immorality or licentiousness as an acceptable thing, or an innumerable host of other falsities. We need to be on guard against such things, and we do that by staying in God's Word, reading it, learning it, meditating on it, and applying it to our lives. <coughs> Jesus has already gained the victory. That is seen and understood already. But we still have a part to play in this ongoing and unfolding narrative called redemptive history. And so, let us trust in the Lord, be obedient to His Word, and accept the victory that He's already won. Let us not lose out by getting involved with falsity, error, manipulation of the word, and so on. We eat three meals a day, and by the next meal that we have, we may not remember what we ate in the last meal. But it still did us good. How can we expect to be filled with good if we neglect reading the word, attending Bible studies, coming to church? That's not how God designed us, and we will suffer for it. This is an appeal to do those things because this is what we need to follow for holy living. Spend more time in the Word, spend more time thinking about the Word, and spend more time talking to the Lord about His Word. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus and let us read our Bibles to the glory of God who sent Jesus and to the glory of God who gave us the Word. Now, I will tell you that once in a while, somebody will send me an email, and I always appreciate it, but they'll say, oh, I can't believe you got those pictures out of that passage, and just arbitrarily pull them out, and they didn't come to me when I was sleeping. They came to me because I'm reading the Bible, and I listen to the Bible when I'm driving, and I say, I just heard that a week ago. I just read that five days ago, and I say... This is what that is telling me. And if I didn't read the Bible every single day of my life, I wouldn't have one type to give you. I'd be giving you life application sermons. They're easy. I can type them in an hour and a half on Monday morning, and I could have the rest of the week to do nothing. But this is hard work. It takes me all day Monday, and sometimes it goes into more days because Jody finds 470,000 <laughs> typing corrections, and I spend an hour just correcting my typing. Okay, these things... As far as the typology is concerned, cannot come unless you know the Bible. And it's important because unless you know the Bible, you can't know what these things are telling you. I mean, this is just typology. The New Testament is where it's revealed. So when my friend asked this week, well, aren't there any, you know, things that teach us doctrine from the Old Testament? That's all we got today. That's all we got. We got typology, but the typology is teaching us doctrine. 100%. Doctrine. It's marvelous how the Word of God weaves itself together, but you cannot know these things if you don't read the Bible. You cannot. And if I give you a sermon, you can say, well, that's great. Charlie said all these things. How do you know that I'm not making this up? Yeah. How do you know? And that is not excusable because if you leave this church and go to another church, you're going to be in the same boat with somebody. I may be the heretic and he may be the right one, and you can't weigh it out on the balances of the Word. Please read your Bible. If there's nothing else that I want people to do in their lives, it is to read the Word of God. I'm so pleased that we had this at the beginning of the service today. This guy emailed me, and he said, tell me about the Trinity. Tell me about what the Bible is telling me, because I want to make sure that this Word is correct before I put my apples in that cart that's a person that wanted to know the true God, and now his life is in jeopardy every month when he invites these people to his house and tells them about Jesus, and he doesn't care. He's gone beyond this world into the next already in his physical being. I am so proud of people like that. Please read your Bible. If you don't do anything else, read your Bible, okay? That's important. Wonderful. And what is the Bible about? We've seen it all the way through. Give me one. Hey, Jesus. Okay. Okay. It's about Jesus. So I, I can't close without telling you, in case you don't know this, 
that Jesus died for your sins. This is the main message of the Bible. John 3, 16 in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, how did that come about? It came about because Jesus Christ died for our sins. Jesus Christ was in the grave, and Jesus Christ rose again, according to Scripture. This is what the Bible is about, and if you believe that simple message, you are frustrating the wisdom of the wise. Those people cannot understand that it can be so simple, and that I am going to prove how good I am when I get up before God, and I'm going to tell him what a great thing he did by saving me. As soon as he says that, <laughs> off to the pit of fire he goes. I'm telling you, trust in the simple gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay, and read your Bible. Ephesians 6 is our closing verse. This is after what I read you earlier in the text verse. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I'm glad that's a metaphor. Above all, taking the... I'm talking about not wearing shoes, okay? Yes. <laughs> Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. He's not sitting in the back of this church right now going like this. He's sitting in a pulpit somewhere telling people lies. That's what this is talking about. Real application in your life. The fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Wonderful. Next week is Joshua 11, 16 through 23. His victory is complete and it is grand. It's entitled, And Joshua Took All the Land. That'll be our 24th Joshua sermon. Now, the Lord has you exactly where he wants you. He has a good plan and a purpose for you. It is he who has defeated the enemy and who now offers his people rest. So follow him and trust him, and he will do marvelous things for you and through you. Okay? Now, I actually stressed over this because today at Publix, they have the, the plate of... Did you have to open the second one? No. Okay. The plate of uh, shrimp. Two for one. I couldn't believe it. I got to the counter and I'm checking out because I'm blind and I never wear my glasses in there. And the lady says, these are two for one. I'm like, okay, so I got it. And I'm thinking, Hedico congregation, Hedico congregation. And then I remembered, I, it's not a, a, a problem for me because we got people here that are visiting and if they get this, then they can't take it home with them. Okay, that's no good. So I'm going to keep that for Hedico. And instead, I, I will give out something that if one of them wins, then they can use it on the way back to where they're going. Okay, this is a $10 Chick-fil-A card from our brother John who comes to visit sometimes from the, uh, for the Bible study. He drives halfway across the Florida with his family once in a while just to attend the Bible study. Okay, here we go. Somebody's going to get this. I'm going to make sure of it because if not, I'm going to get another question. I got to get rid of these things. Okay. <laughs> Don't make it so hard. <laughs> Don't make it so hard. Okay, now this has one of two possible answers, actually. What? Oh, okay, I thought somebody... Okay, this has one of two possible answers. Now, this is why you want to read your Bible, is because if you do, and you were in that passage yesterday, you can say, oh, oh, I got that. I got my Chick-fil-A. <laughs> what is the name of Jonathan's son who was lame in both yeah, feet? Oh, yeah. hey, there you go. That was, he said it so fast, hey, I didn't even finish the question. Oh, well then give it to your mother. She loves Chick-fil-A. I don't know if that's true or not. I can tell you that the Chick-fil-A, I'd never had one until I went with Sergio and Rhoda one time. The spicy chicken sandwich may be the best thing on this planet after durian. I'm not kidding. It is unbelievable. Congratulations. <laughs> that was outstanding. I, I didn't, it, you said that as well? Okay, his voice was loud. Okay. Oh, he, he was listening to that yesterday, he said. That is what I want people to do. Listen to your Bible, read your Bible, know your Bible, and so you can get a gift certificate next week. Okay? All right. No, next week is this. Claudia made this. And so 
when when we have next week, somebody's going to take this home with them so they can have it out for their Christmas celebration. Okay? Here we go. I got a poem, and we're going to take the Lord's Supper. This is entitled, The Waters of Maron. And it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hatzor, heard these things, that he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, to the king of Shimron, to the king of Achshaf, and to the kings who were from the north, in the mountains where skiing is the best, in the plains south of Kinneroth, in the lowland, in the heights of Dor, on the west, to the Canaanites in the east and in the west, the Amorite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, hoorah, the Jebusite in the mountains, and the Hivite below Hermon in the land of Mizpah. So they went out, they and all their armies with them, as many people as the sand that is on the seashore in multitude, with very many horses and chariots and army quite grand. And when all these kings had met together, so the account does tell, they came and camped together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. But the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid because of them, so to you I tell, for tomorrow about this time I will deliver all of them slain before Israel. You shall their horses hamstring and burn their chariots with fire. Yes, you shall do this thing. So Joshua and all the people of war with him came against them suddenly. Surely they will get whacked by the waters of Merom. Israel fell upon them and attacked. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who defeated them and chased them to greater Sidon, to the brook Mizraphot and to the valley of Mizpah eastward. They attacked them until they left of them remaining none. So Joshua did to them as the Lord had told him. Yes, so he had learned. He hamstrung their horses and their chariots with fire he burned. Joshua turned back at that time and took Hatzor and struck its king with the sword. For Hatzor was formerly the head of all those kingdoms but it was a goner before the Lord. And they struck all the people who were in it with the edge of the sword as the battle churned, utterly destroying them. There was nothing left breathing. Then hot sore, he with fire burned. So all the cities of those kings and all their kings, Joshua took and struck with the edge of the sword as the situation demanded. He utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. But as for the cities that stood on their mounds, Israel burned none of them burning them was burned, except Hatzor only, which Joshua burned, and all the spoil of these cities and the livestock. The children of Israel took as booty for themselves. Oh, what fun! But they struck every man with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them, and they left breathing no one. As the Lord had commanded Moses, his servant, so Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua did also. He left nothing undone. Of all that the Lord had commanded Moses... Yes, it was so. Lord God, turn our hearts to be obedient to your word. Give us wisdom to be ever faithful to you. May we carefully heed each thing we have heard. Yes, Lord God, may our hearts be faithful and true. And we shall be content and satisfied in you alone. We will follow you as we sing our songs of praise. Hallelujah to you, to us, your path you have shown. Hallelujah. We shall sing to you for all of our days. Hallelujah and amen. Show with the hot sore. Oh, okay, yeah. I already sent you five pictures. Is that, will you be able That's to why I'll add them in later. Yeah, go ahead. And uh, so cool. I, just, exactly what you were talking about because we've oh, been there, but we've never done a video about it. Oh, okay. Now he's going to show you something from the video itself, and um, uh, you can't see online right now, but I will. Or they can no, see no, online. No, okay, no, but no, I will add them in, yeah. in as well there. during the sermon. And they'll be able to see here as well. I, I have to tell you, somebody emailed me this week and said, this makes the Bible come alive for him. I can't remember who sent that. I'm sorry. That's anyway, oh, this great. at the end of these sermons, if you add these in, if it comes to your mind and you can, they, he, he was so thankful for this. Oh, that's so cool. And because you were saying this, and like, this is cool. So we did go to Hula Valley. And as you can see, the 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 you fight. Did? Yeah, so Red and I went to Hula Valley. And, oh, no, oh. <laughs> And so <laughs> we're to Hala Valley, but the where the fight actually happened, and there is supposed to be a lake, but in our video you won't find the lake because it's been dried over the past uh, like you know, 50 or 60 years. They dried it, and now it's agriculture. There are no more swamps, but you can imagine that area, and that's how it looks like. Where they would have a huge, and the picture doesn't come up. So oh, there it is. So that that area down there, that is the uh, oh, area of Merom Lake, and so. Oh. Once there was a lake in the time, oh, actually, just a few hundred years ago, there was a lake, but now it's not a lake. So if you go there, you won't find the lake. There are a few ponds, but it's mostly been dried and uh, made proper for cultivation and agriculture. 
Uh, but the cool thing is that as you were reading this, and I was thinking, the coalition that came against Joshua, well, this happened again just on the, in Yom Kippur War. That's right. And they, I've and, yeah. been there. I've seen where that happened. Yeah, and so they have this valley right here where this picture is taken from. That's Rodana standing on the valley of right here. There's another valley called the Valley of Tears. Have you ever heard of this? It's like huge fight in Yom Kippur about... 12 or over 1200 tanks come from Syria and there's only about 170 on the Israeli so 10 times the force over completely over uh, overpowered and completely complete, overwhelmed yeah overwhelmed yeah. and the coalition of all the northern countries you got the Syria and the support of Lebanon everyone else around them and yet God gives the victory to the yes. Israel mm -hmm. and and I'm thinking well I know because kind of when I was in the military in the Air Force, our commander came and he was speaking about Yom Kippur, but also the Six Day War. And he was saying he was one of the, um, he's a general, and he was one of the um, pilots uh, when they were going down to Egypt. And it says the Egyptian army, uh, when they came to us, we were outnumbered again, 10 times, 10 to 1. And when they came to us, they saw millions of Israeli soldiers and they thought they must have had someone else come to help them and they started running away. So it's some kind of mirage and you could think it, it can happen in the desert when you got the heat and it kind of the image kind of thing. But still, the fact that this happened and they won tells us and the general says, well, I don't believe in God, but this was the closest day I thought it wasn't us. It must have something else helped us and uh, maybe there is some kind of power. And I'm thinking, we don't deserve this as Israelis. We don't deserve this victory. And I'm thinking, did the, did the Israeli, with jo Joshua, the people following, did they deserve it? God did it all. You, when you said yeah. for Jesus, I'm thinking, even today, those victories are for Jesus because he's Absolutely. he's going to come back and he's preparing all this. So I thought that is so cool. And then the last thing I wanted to share is the Hazor. So oh, and this is the Valley of uh, Tears, and they called it right next to Waters of Merom, just in the Old Testament, because the, the second day of the battle, they woke up and oh, woke up. Wait, they went to the valley, the light came up, and uh, they saw just endless numbers of Syrian tanks destroyed and was smoke wow. over the entire area. You couldn't breathe. It was called the Valley of Tears. Um, that's kind of a devastation, destruction. And again, I thought of this as you were reading the complete devastation, destruction that Joshua brought, and also the I next chapter. I thought you were, had a problem with something I said in the sermon you were going to tell me later. And oh. I'm like, oh, <laughs> I, I got something wrong. No, no. <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> And, and this, the last thing is Hatzor. And so Hatzor was part of the sermon. It is so cool because Joshua destroyed it with fire. And so there is Hatzor. It's an excavation site. Rod and I still didn't go there, but we're going to go there uh, and do a video about it. At least we hope so. And it's a fascinating place because it's one of those unique places where they excavate and they actually find incredible evidence. And when they start excavating, they find these layers of strata of more of a modern city that was rebuilt afterwards, like you said, and then a little older, older. And then they get to a strata, a level of dirt that is completely burned, and not just burnt. It was an inferno level of destruction they didn't see before. They found, they, they exactly estimated- Exactly the Bible says. Exactly what it says. They said they estimated the, it would have been 12 or 1300 Fahrenheit degrees, the, the, the fire that the inferno was caused there because that city was built. They found a lot of timber wood. It was kind of constructed with a lot of wood. Mm -hmm. And so the fire went, and right. that's incredible. It dates back to the time of uh, Joshua. Mm -hmm. So, and that's, that was really cool. So those two, and then last, I wanted to say, just it's not related, is um, is uh, small news, which is good, good. I spoke to this with Charlie, and that is, if you notice, Rod and I haven't done videos for a while, and just been so much overwhelming, the move and uh, the company and the work and everything. And so I'm gonna take a break from communion and give it back to Charlie, just so I can focus all the energy to the videos. And so I spoke to Charlie, it's a win-win. This is Charlie's favorite thing to do, I think. That's what you Absolutely. said. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and I don't get to uh, hug all these people when they're going by. You know, somebody's <laughs> leaving or whatever. Or... Yeah, yeah, and I never thought this. This doesn't take time, but it's a responsibility, and it's a wonderful and honor. But I feel like I need to focus all the energy to get those videos out. That we already have some of them are like a year and a half old that we still need to edit. So we got to do those. So uh, I'm excited, and uh, Char Charlie's excited. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm ready to go. Excellent. Uh, so. Good stuff. Thank you for that. Wow, that's wonderful. Oh uh, gosh. Okay, let's see here. Um, is this, were you in that? You were standing here. Yeah, I, I think they could see you. Okay, good. As long as they can see you, because if not, then we got this voice and nothing going on. Oh, boy. Well, I get to take communion today. Yes, that's, that's a plus, too. I've kind of enjoyed that, coming with Hedeko. something that i would never done before. And so it's kind of nice I get to hear. Go on. Go on. Okay, let's see here. Um, Boy, it's been a while. Um, <laughs> There's a list of instructions there. Yeah, I, I definitely need them. 
<laughs> definitely <laughs> need them. Uh, marvelous stuff. I, I loved what happened up there with uh, with the um, uh, the Trail of Tears or whatever it's called. Not the Trail of Tears, but the Valley of Tears. Valley of Tears. That's, that's the Cherokees. Anyway, um, yeah, when I was there, they had one tank that they've left there, a French tank that's just sitting there. And uh, I was there with mom in 2003, and the guy was telling about this particular area that the settlers didn't have any tanks where they were, and yet they had their homemade Molotov cocktails and stuff. And they went in and they defeated an entire line of tanks, laying on the ground, popping up, opening the thing, throwing it, in. just by, with their hands, they defeated these tanks. And... Uh, uh, yet they failed to give glory to God. Yeah, right. And so um, it's going to cost them in the end, but yeah. we're seeing prophecy fulfilled in the process. And so it's wonderful. And we're also seeing, as amazing as it is, and I get excited every time I get into a sermon and I see, we are seeing typology fulfilled in Christ. You know, all of the prophecy in the world about Israel is great and it's ear tickling, but when it comes to what's actually happening in the Bible, it's all leading to Jesus, either his first advent or his second advent. And so that's where the real meat of it is. Israel is a part of that happening, as are the Gentiles. So, oh, wonderful stuff. Okay. In uh, 1 Corinthians 11, Paul wrote, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And he would have blessed his bread. He would have given what's called the barecha, um, where they bless the bread and the wine and all that stuff in Israel. And these go back long before the time of Jesus. And uh, this probably would have been something very similar to what he would have said, if not e these exact words. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu, melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. Think of Jesus dying, his body being broken, and then the bread coming out of the earth again. And he broke it and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper. And he would have blessed us as well. He would have said, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Borei Peri HaGuffin. Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Amen. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Amen. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. together you're right <laughs> it's good it's good feeling the body and the blood of the lord jesus the body and the blood of the lord jesus just i don't know if i'm gonna see anyone we'll get done or not thank you for making this effort very very nice of you wonderful what a blessing for us the body and the blood of the lord jesus you come so good to see you again
the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Amen. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. You tell Bob I said hi if you see him Wednesday. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. I told him that. He's appreciated by so many. I get emails about him all the time. All the time. That's Bob. And he misses it. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. I can't believe you won't be here Christmas Day. <laughs> Try not to cry. Have a good time. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. I'm just upset about it. Always you something are. going on. Kids, you I don't know. like it. <laughs> the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Mm-hmm. How are you ladies today? Good. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. That's the Lord's word. Always wonderful. So precious. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. You don't look like sure. No, not even close. About three feet shorter, too. Three feet shorter. The body and the blood of the Lord Jesus. Well, I feel that way. Those are great. You'll love them. They're, they're marshmallows, but they're from J Japan. They've got, um, uh, yeah. The, Jim and Ejen, they come, they've come here a couple times okay. here in Virginia. They bring yeah. They sent us for the church. Yeah. Wonderful stuff. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Okay, we have a um, couple of prayer requests. One of them is, I didn't mention at the beginning of the uh, service, it didn't dawn on my mind, but Karen here has lost permanent sight in her eye. And so we want to keep her in prayer that her other eye does not get affected. Karen, right behind you. Oh. And yeah, and so keep her in prayer. And uh, Joanne, what's that? Joanne, Joanne our uh, uh, Faith, my daughter-in-law's aunt, who I baptized just recently, got rushed to the hospital today, and so we don't know what's going on. So keep her in prayer as well. And uh, let's see here. Um, I guess that's it. We'll go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the chance to come into your presence and to uh, share in your Word and to uh, share in your goodness. And we thank you for this Lord's table. We thank you for what it signifies. And we ask that you bless each person here in the week ahead, each person online that's attending, and fill their hearts and their souls with happiness and joy. And Lord, we anticipate coming here again next week, if it's your will, and uh, hearing your word preached again. And until then, we just want to give you all the glory that you deserve. You are so wonderful. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for Jesus, our Lord. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.